Exploration Radio is proudly sponsored by the AIG, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists. The 2020 AIG Mentor Program is now open for registration. Whether you are a mentee looking for some career guidance or networking opportunities, or an experienced geoscientist looking to give back to your community, now is the time to sign up. It is free for students and mentors, with a small fee for graduates and members. You need to be an AIG member, but the application process is easy and pretty straightforward. And also remember, becoming a member of the AIG means you're also supporting things like this podcast. For more information on the mentor program or the AIG itself, visit aig.org.au. That is aig.org.au. Registrations for the mentor program close 31st March. Welcome to another episode of Exploration Radio. Before we get into this episode, I want to tell you a story about Walt Disney. During the early days of the Disney Studios in the 1930s, Walt realized that there was something lacking in the cartoonists that were being hired by his studio. He realized that these cartoonists needed additional skills to be able to do what was required from them. So on December 23, 1935, Walt sent a memo to Don Graham, who was a highly respected art teacher at the Chunard Art Institute. Walt was asking for Don's help in running some structured art classes for Disney employees. Let me read you some excerpts from this memo. Right after the holidays, I want to get together with you and work out a very systematic training course for young animators, and also outline a plan of approach for our older animators. Some of our established animators at the present time are lacking in many things, and I think we should arrange a series of courses to enable these men to learn and acquire the things they lack. I have found that men respond much more readily to classes dealing with practical problems than to more theoretic treatment. Therefore, I think it would be a very good idea to appeal to these men by conducting these classes with a practical approach in mind. In other words, try to show in these classes that the men can make immediate practical application of what they are being taught. I believe these classes could be combined for presentation to all the animators, young and old as well. So what Walt was looking for was a way to train his employees to become better animators, something he felt was fundamental to the survival of the studio. But Disney Studios would have had access to the best cartoonists in the country. So what exactly was it that Walt thought that they were lacking? Here is Walt from an interview in the late 1940s, describing it in his own words. I made a deal with some of the teachers at Chenard to come out and work with me, to sit with me by the day to know my problems. That, in turn, uh, gave them a chance to know what we had to work on. I picked this Don Graham, and Don Graham sat right with me in what we call our sweat box, where I would sit in there with the tests coming through with each artist who worked out everything, so Don could observe my problem. The problem was to get away from the static drawing, to get away from the drawing in front of you and make that drawing a part of a motion, part of a movement. So Walt wasn't looking for the best cartoonist, he was looking for the best animators. Specifically, he was looking for people that knew how to convey motion and movement in their drawings, and could couple that with emotion and a sense of storytelling. These skills were not being taught at art institutes at the time. There were no formal schools or qualifications for becoming an animator. So Walt took it upon himself to create and fund training for his own employees. But the effect of these courses was broader than just at Disney Studios. Here's Walt Disney again. Well, I started, oh no, I had, my, I, enlarged, I had my training school in 1933, but then it was a class of about 20 at a time. Now there was 100 at a time. I trained artists for the whole cartoon industry. The ones that didn't make the grade with me moved out, and they are now part of the whole cartoon industry. At the time when I started in Hollywood, there was, I was the only cartoon studio. Now, in fact, all the studios, with the exception of a couple in the East, are in Hollywood. So actually, the, the, the training I did now has supplied artists all over. They're all doing commercials. They're all in business themselves. But say 90% of them are from, from my training pool. You see. A lot of them I never got to know because we bring them in, start them training, and if they can make the grade, then was the time to know them. You see. So it was a busy studio. We were trying to uh, do different things. I wanted to, uh, every way I could, I trying to improve the medium, trying to improve our cameras, techniques, but in a laboratory so we could develop certain processes that would help us to get better results on the screen. Well, I trained, trained a lot of them at that time. Today I, I'm back with the apprenticeship. But it took care of the need I had at that time for a good-sized staff. It is hard to argue that aside from helping Disney survive and thrive in the early days of animation, 
These courses led to a revolution in the whole industry. They helped create the concept of what it is to be an animator. And not just that, but also what techniques and equipment are needed to better capture animation on film. Some people argue that it was these courses that gave Disney its competitive advantage and led to the studio's dominance in the golden age of animation in the 1930s and 40s. But as Walt said, the courses did more than just help Disney. They ended up training a generation of animators for the whole industry. Since these courses first started at Disney in 1933, the studio has been running them largely uninterrupted for more than 80 years. Ultimately, Walt did not just end up making Disney better, he ended up making the whole industry better. What does this story about Walt Disney and Disney Studios have to do with this episode? Well, our guest today is Richard Lilly, who runs Nexus, the National Exploration Undercover School, a three-week program built around teaching undergraduate geoscience students the practical skills they will need to succeed in a career in the resources industry. At a time when most companies have scrapped graduate programs, which used to teach the key practical skills required in the industry, and university is not really interested in teaching industry-specific practical skills anymore, it's initiatives like Nexus that are trying to bridge the gap by teaching students the fundamental skills from the past, but more importantly, also giving them a broad understanding of the skills that may be relevant in the future. Like how Walt and Disney worked on fixing the skills gap in cartoonists becoming animators, Richard and his team are working on skills that geoscientists may need in the future. So come join us and let's find out a little bit more about Nexus and Richard Lilly. Richard, welcome to Exploration Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. So today we want to talk to you about uh, a school that you run called Nexus. But before we get into that, can you give us a little bit of background to yourself? How did you get to where you are right now? Oh, look, I um, did my original geology degree at Cardiff University in the UK. Um, always very keen on exploration and that side of geology. When I graduated in 2000, there were no jobs. Done some vacation work with Rio Tinto, but there was nothing happening. So uh, among other things, I went back to uni and did a PhD in ophiolite geochemistry in Oman and the United Arab Emirates, which was great field work, loved it. And then finished that and did a fairly typical PhD thing of hanging around at the university for a, for a few months afterwards, trying to find the right career. And uh, a, a role came up with uh, Mount Isa Mines, and I jumped at it. I was really excited. That was, you know, it was my dream to, you know, drive around the outback looking for copper and gold, and it was fantastic. So myself and my wife and our son, who was only 18 months at the time, uh, moved out to Mount Isa in 2007. Yeah, wow. And we had eight fantastic years up there. I loved working up there. It was a fantastic community. And of course, the geology up there is just mind blowing. Every day was, you know, you pick up a rock going, I didn't know you could do that. And um, it took me a few years after the PhD to get over the PhD, realize that there's so much more to learn. And then I guess after a few years, I, you could say I was the champion for applied research. And then we started getting um, honor students in, and that worked really, really well. So this is at Mount Isa Mines? At Mount Isa, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then after a certain amount of time, I guess I found the research and looking at the rocks in that way was taking 10% of my time, but providing about 90% of my motivation. So I uh, wrote a proposal to my manager to basically have me as, as, as an embedded researcher down in Adelaide. Okay. And I was very pleased when it was accepted. So in 2015, we moved down to Adelaide. And for the first three years in Adelaide University, I was Mount Isa Mines Embedded Researcher and coordinated PhDs and honours and various other bits of research for predominantly exploration, but also for the operations like Ernest Henry and Mount Isa Mines. Yeah, wow. That's kind of been extended um, each year. And then in 2016, we founded the Nexus course. Do you want to talk about what is Nexus? So Nexus um, stands for the National Exploration Undercover School. Uh, we founded it in 2016. We're very fortunate that the Minerals Council of Australia has always been very proactive in the space of representing the minerals industry and in their uh, Minerals Tertiary Education Council, MTEC, fund educational activities and initiatives. So the MCA used to fund the MTEC courses, which were essentially for every geoscience honour student in the country could go and do a one-week course somewhere in the country. I think they did two. And most of the universities that do geoscience did one. And I actually went on one when I first got to Adelaide, and I was amazed that most of the people there didn't care. They were just, you know, literally there on a holiday. 
And I kind of thought, this is a strange model that the MCA is funding, fly all these students around the country and essentially it was costing them a couple of million dollars a year. And in 2015, um, during that low point in the industry, the MCA looked at its funding and said, look, that's very expensive. We can't do that anymore. So they sent an email around to the universities and said, look, we're cancelling the MTech course, but we're going to then put out expressions of interest for a new scheme. And it was quite funny because I was fairly new at Adelaide at the time and Graham Heinsohn invited me in for a few meetings and there was a lot of grumbling, a few teleconferences where there was a lot of grumbling from the university saying, oh, how dare they take our funding away, blah, blah, blah. And it was kind of interesting because the universities had sort of maybe got a bit complacent. Each university had enough money to essentially employ a full-time member of staff, so it's very generous funding. And Graham Heinsohn, instead of being you know, negative, he said, well, thank you, Minerals Council. You've funded us for 12 or 13 years and we will go and put our thinking caps on and come up with something. And Graham came up with the idea for Nexus being like a three-week summer school. Okay. In North America, I think they have, I'm not sure of the name, but they have a geophysical summer school where keen geophysicists go off to a, literally a summer camp by the, in the woods in log cabins and do geophysics. And Graham thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we built a similar model for undercover exploration and take 30 students from around the country and have them for three weeks? And between him and I, we fleshed out a sort of three-week program I guess I reached out to academics, but also industry contacts. I see a lot of expertise outside of the universities. It's not solely university-based. And of course, wonderful um, people at the geological surveys and all of that kind of really just, we really went for the, the passionate people, the people that s stood out to us. Was it, uh, was it hard to convince people to become part of this? Actually, no, everyone's been incredibly generous with their time. We've had so much positivity. It's been one of the highlights of my career. Like it's, um, it's incredibly positive. So we proposed to the Minerals Council the idea and they funded it. So that was in 2016 we did our first. And of course, we didn't quite know what to expect. We'd never done this before. And again, it's down to the, the cohort of students who came. We had over 100 applications for that first year. And we picked out 30. It's meant to be around 30 because 30 is a good group number for, for general activities, logistics and things. I always try and squeeze a couple more in. So it's always been sort of 32 or 33. And how do you get the students? Are they undergraduates? Are they graduates? I guess because we were sort of replacing the MTech courses, I guess our target audience would be third years and honor students. Mm -hmm. And really, we always saw it as trying to fill that gap between what you learn at university and what industry wants you to know. Every day in Nexus, we do something different. So maybe the first day we might look at Deep Geophysics MT. Mm -hmm. So we'll get the MT experts from the Geological Survey of South Australia come in and give a fantastic overview of MT. Most of the students have never heard of MT. Mm -hmm. Second day, we might do a, a one-day regolith workshop. It's actually one of the highlights of the course. The students don't even haven't even heard the term regolith. No one teaches regolith at university. Um, but obviously, each one of these things could be a one-week or a three-day, five-day workshop. So every day of Nexus is pretty different, and we do a lot of fun stuff too. We, it's also kind of showcasing South Australia a little bit. Um, so we take them to the Oval for a, there's always a test match on during Nexus. So we have a day at the cricket. We um, organise some nice events. Doing like a soil survey in the Barossa Valley or something like that. I'm sure that's on there as well. well. We, have, we haven't yet, but I guess the other thing with Nexus is not just to sit down three weeks of listening to someone. Mm -hmm. um, so week one is based at the Tonsley Core Library facility. Week two, we go into the field to a place called Strathalban, and there's an old, lovely old sort of 18s, 80s kind of working there called Wheel Ellen and Hillgrove Resources have been very kind to let us use that site. And it's great because it's patchy, a little bit of outcrop, but it's you know essentially covered. And they physically do geophysics. We collect MT data, we collect IP, resistivity, we do a range of things, gravity, magnetics, um, do some soil sampling. It's fantastic. And then the third week, we go up to Wallaroo, you know, it's one of the few areas you've actually got gall or craton exposed. So we have a look at um, those exposures. We do um, an all textures and breaches course that I teach. And then we go down to the hillside deposit owned by Rex Resources. Mm -hmm. I look at it like we sort of give them a, an overview. There's no way we could teach them everything. But what we do do is we introduce them to the people who are experts. Mm -hmm. So when the student works in WA a year later, they think, oh, we've got a problem with our regolith. What will I do? Oh, well, I'll, I'll email Carmen and see what, um, see what she thinks. And, or I'll email the person from Newmont who came and gave a talk about a similar experience. So, you know, every night there's a, like a, I'd say kind of informal kind of Q&A, often with slides, but often without. We really talk about technical aspects of geology. We get a lot of people come in and talk about their career paths. That's something that students are really concerned about, you know, doing the right thing, making the right choice. So hearing people um, in their sort of early to mid-career or more, we've had some fantastic engagement from BHP 
Laura Tyler, Kathy Eric, they have come in and spoken to the students. You know, we, we cover a lot of ground, but it's fun. I think we're not trying to sit in an ivory tower and say, you should be doing this and this. They're all self-starters, all engaged students. I guess the the one benefit that I see is that, you know, by the way that you set up the school is you're kind of self-selecting the people that come to your school already. So there are people that are willing to learn or are willing to, to engage in that sense. Absolutely. It's one of the nicest aspects of Nexus is the, the cohort that we get through. In terms of applications, we have a website. We send out emails to various geological departments say, you know, can you let the students know that Nexus is open for sort of accepting applications? We do that sort of in the first half of the year. And so you only run the course once a year? Once a year. It runs last week of November, first two weeks of December, which is quite handy because that's after exams, but potentially before vacation work starts. Or So it's in a nice little window. And have you had trouble getting students on the course? No, not at all. So the first year we had well over about 120 applications. Second year was around 75. And then this year was around 80 to 90 people apply. Okay. Originally, I thought it would be good to have as many people as possible. But what I've realized is the the people we, we end up picking, the keen, passionate ones who express that in their application, having a group is essentially having a lot of the people who really love geology and love geoscience and exploration, having them all in the same room or on the same course. They sort of learn from each other. They talk to each other. The bonds that they make in the three weeks has really surprised us and obviously very pleasantly surprised us. I think we see it now that they're sort of making networks for life, really, mm-hmm. friends for life. It's a pretty wide kind of alumni network that you're setting up. Absolutely. No, we um, we strive to have a cohort that represents the whole of Australia. So we're not just going to take 30 Adelaide students. But that's the only caveat in our application process that we try and spread around the country. But in terms of calibre of students, they've all been fantastic. If you take the business model of Harvard or Stanford, the alumni of those places run the world. That's the way the business model works. And not only do they build bonds while they're on the course, but they're actually a network for the rest of their life. And these people rise to positions of power, resending people back to do the course. And these whole schools run based on alumni. No, I would like to think that the Nexus cohort that come through are going to achieve great things. I mean, a lot of them, well, I think in terms of employment and in terms of career progression, they're all well above the curve and they're doing great things. We actually had a, a reunion just a few days ago and to see how they've grown, how they're progressing with their careers is, is fantastic and very rewarding. But I do feel that a lot of the people who apply now are within the networks of the alumni and they're saying, oh, I heard such good things. We want to be part of this. And uh, So what, what's something you would do differently now that you've had a couple of goals at this course? Of Nexus? Yeah, like what would you change? Well, we tweak it every year. It hasn't been the same. I guess we built the core activities you kind of set the structure up and then you... Based around the uncover, yeah. sort of those main four. Every year we get different people in. I think this year, for example, we're going to have a couple of data days where we look a lot more at data science and artificial intelligence machine learning because that's not something we've done a great deal of. One of the um, dichotomies of Nexus is that we cover a lot of leading edge exploration science, but we also cover a lot of the basics. You know, We go and dig soil samples. We actually do a lot of the fundamentals. We look at basic minerals you know we make sure everyone that leaves can identify epidote so or pyrite or whatever but there is this thing within exploration and teaching and learning that you can't do all the new stuff without knowing the old stuff and they both have value it's actually one of the things that i that appeals to me the most is that you get to embed some of the more transformative new science on the foundations every geologist has to have foundations in order to do the pointy stuff But sometimes you worry about how you're actually going to get the pointy stuff to people anyway. But because it's a long form, three weeks is quite long. Most workshops, most short courses are a few days, which is not enough. It's not enough to do both. I guess that's the that's the difference. Absolutely. One thing I should also say is, you know, even though our core market for the, the cohort is third year in honours, the first couple of years we reached out to all the geological surveys and said, have you got any early career people you want to send in? It's interesting, in the first three years, we've pretty much had all the young people from the surveys. We've obviously also made a number of places available to early career industry. I think we sort of cap it at three years experience. Um, so I think the first year we had three or four people who were working the aim originally for that was to get people in who might be working for junior companies who may not have access to graduate schemes or might have limited career development opportunities. But every year we're getting more and more applications from early career industry. And I think we're realizing that a lot of the, the skills that we're teaching or the methodologies that we're making people aware of 
if you try to do that at undergraduate, people just aren't ready. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough of a basis of actual geology. Whereas, you know, once you've gone through the ups and downs of undergraduate, the downs and ups of honours and the sort of freaking out of getting a job and moving and actually starting that side of your career. After a couple of years in industry, you're probably crying out for a bit of um, going back and remembering what you loved about geology in the first place. And I think we, we get that a lot from the students that they've particularly in, in the feedback we get, the particularly the people we've heard a, a number of times where people have said you've sort of rekindled my sort of flame for geology, you know, we've sort of given me room and that is very rewarding. Do you have a, a desire to branch out to, you know, like you said, early to mid-career people? Can you go older, younger maybe? Can I come? <laughs> oh, look, um, yes, that would be wonderful to have you both involved. But I think after the first one, I think we realized that you could take each of the days, like you could take the regolith day, and that would be a perfect three, four, five day workshop, potentially with a field component. And I proposed this to the university as, you know, could we run this as a master's? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this at the time, but master's courses are very unpopular because you need to, there's a lot of content, a lot of work, you gotta, someone's got to do it. And master's courses tend to be quite popular for a few years and then tail off. So this year we tried to do a nexus, like a mini nexus for first and second years to try and get some of it in earlier. We actually planned it. We had fantastic contributions planned from Oz Minerals, FMG, also I we're going to chip in, we, and BHP, of course, um, so South Australian-based companies. But we had to cancel it because despite letting 60 or 70 potential students know about it, only eight of them signed up. They're just not ready. The eight that signed up did get something. We, we organized a, a, a smaller sort of workshop and a visit, but it was, in, it was a learning curve for me that, you know, really you'd be better off starting even earlier, like high school or, you know, you need to be in like school age to seed that idea. University is too busy a time anyway. And then again, lifelong learning and micro-credentialing is really where the conversation is these days. And I think one of my plans for next year is to make, um, we're going to call it Nexus Professional Development, so Nexus PD. Mm -hmm. We're going to take some of the excellent courses that we run during Nexus and we're going to make them into workshops. And those will be made available for industry participants, uh, PhD students, undergraduates. Okay. And hopefully, the, in a business model sense, if, the, if we can partner up with some companies and, and actually charge money for the course, then that can start to you know, reimburse the maybe consultants who come in to give the course, but also start to build a little bit of a, a business where Nexus could actually grow. Because again, we're limited each year. Um, the way the Minerals Council receives its funding, they can't commit to funding Nexus other than on a year-by-year -year basis. So do you currently have any pressure to be a sustainable business as a school? I've had that conversation with Graham Heinsohn, but we haven't had it with the university in that sense. But okay. um, again, you know, we're something of a novelty. We're sort of, industry knows about it, but I'd say most within academia don't know about it too much. So, I mean, I think what you're kind of describing is the scalability problem. You're going to be wildly successful, which is a good thing for you, but it also creates this problem that if you're going to have 300 people trying to break your door down to get on this course, then that's a challenge for you in your current setup. Oh, look, the easiest and probably most profitable thing to do would be to split Nexus off and start it as a company mm -hmm. and actually just run it as, you know, like Snowden's do, running courses. But I think having the university tie-in is valued and I think that is useful because at the moment students don't get a certificate or anything from it. We're not sort of accredited in that sense. It's, um, we, although we are engaging with the AIG and OzIMM to have it as, um, as professional development hours. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it falls in a bit of a gray area with university sort of um, accreditation in terms of, you know, getting it as a, a, a degree or a named qualification. But certainly everyone who's done it puts it on their CV and I think it stands out. So is, that's probably a conversation we need to have with the university and say, look, where does this fit on your scale? And is there a drive to actually increase it? And, and actually something that Graham Heinsohn has been leading at Adelaide is incorporating some aspects of Nexus into a proposed honours stream where people can take some of the best bits of Nexus and do that as part of an honours course and then do a small research project at the end. And that kind of trying to fill the gap. But it's amazing how much pushback that idea is getting because a lot of the academics are worried that we're going to dilute the PhD stream and you know it'd be a lesser valued honours because again, it's industry engagement or industry related work is not as valued. I don't know what the actual solution is here. Sounds really strange. I mean, the way you're describing a course would be a perfect applied science course, you would think, yeah, if that's what people wanted to go. Or you at least give people the choice. You can go a fundamental science degree if you want, or you could go down the path of collecting more applied courses. I, I think that would that would make sense, but it seems really strange. It, it, it is. I, I don't quite understand it because 
everyone knows there's a need for it. There's a growing skills gap. We need to address it. And, you know, universities are famously slow and, you know, very unmaneuverable. But um, I think the, the conversation of micro-credentialing and the conversation of lifelong learning, I think, is, is very important. And the other thing is it doesn't have to be University of Adelaide or Nexus. There's nothing stopping any university geoscience department in the country offering professional development courses. They're needed. I do notice that the ones that are offered currently are kind of the same ones that have been offered for quite a long time. And perhaps there is a need for maybe some innovation in what they offer. But again, there's a lot of talk about what we need to do as an industry or what we need to do to explore effectively undercover, but we just need to bloody do it. I mean, I think this is something that Steve and I have talked about, that I think if you look at certain disciplines, like say medicine, there is a lot of value in the accreditation that you get through a, a legitimate provider, let's say. You, know, you go to a university, you go to a med school, you get your uh, residency and you get your certification at the end, you know, whatever you specialize in, and then that carries a lot of weight because it's taken a lot of time. But there's also the alternate model, which is more kind of the IT space or data science, I think is a classic one. Most people that know data science have been self-taught on YouTube or MOOC courses. They're not accredited courses. But a lot of that space sits around that you just have to show your skills and that's your accreditation. You know, you can have a GitHub or show your code or whatever you've written and you're, and you're okay. I think universities haven't quite made that link that there are certain disciplines where the accreditation is no longer the be-all and end-all. There are certain things like medicine, well, fair enough, that will always be the case because I don't know if you want someone doing surgery on you that has learned it on YouTube, but, uh, but that accreditation is important. But there are a lot of disciplines that are now falling in the space where you just have to show that you have applied knowledge or some skills and then employers are willing to take a, take a bet on it. I agree. I, th I think... It also comes down to the individual that wants to learn and wants to improve and continually develop and making sure there's that kind of opportunity. So back in 2011, um, Extrada Copper sent me to do Roger Taylor's All Textures course. Completely changed how I look at complex breaches and hydrothermal alteration. Essentially changed my life. Certainly changed how I looked at rocks. Which, which changed your which life. Which changed my life. No, yeah. it, <laughs> but uh, the, you know... Roger's not getting any younger. You know, a lot of the very experienced people who I guess tend to end up being consulting, they're leaving the industry because of age. And I don't really see who's taking their place. There's going to be a gap when a lot of these, you know, sort of older consultants, you know, stop consulting. And this is at a time where things are getting more complex just in general in any career. So the concept of lifelong learning is now across every business, across every industry. So how do we reconcile that we seem to be trending in the opposite direction? I'm not too sure. I think certainly you see with recruitment with some of the larger companies often looking at non-traditional disciplines and looking at mixing it up. Um, there's some great examples of where people have been hired who did maths and geology and have ended up going on to do fantastic data science work. I'm not sure. I, I, I think every company is going to have its own approach to this. So I'm not really sure if the university space is really what is going to influence. The universities, I think, need to concentrate on being good at what they do, which is teaching fundamental science and producing good, solid geoscientists. And I think there are some disciplines where I think maybe the, the rate of how you do things, if it increases beyond a point, I think it's going to be really difficult for universities to keep pace with it unless they change that model. My brother works as a software engineer. and His value to his company is about picking up applicable skills when required. He understands that there's going to be breaks in his career where he'll have to go and pick up skills and then those skills will be in vogue and some of his skills will not be in vogue and then that's kind of the way you have to go. So are we sitting back and waiting for these courses to magically appear when they may not be needed? Yeah, I guess my question there was going to be that I think someone has to pick up that role that we keep talking about these out of university, non-accredited but highly applicable courses that people could use to build their skills over time. Now, who has the responsibility to actually do that? Is that a role like professional organizations could play? Is, is that their role? OzIMM and AIG and, and ASCG, very proactive in that space. There's certainly plenty of courses that do do that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they're following the current trends in particular exploration, for example. And those professional organizations essentially rely on people volunteering their time. Um, to or, right. to organise them, so the physical that's a major logistic. limitation in that whole thing. So I, th I think it's pretty traditional that you know industry looks to academia to do this, and academia looks to industry to do this. So I, I guess one of the things I've thought a lot about when I'm at university was the relationship between industry and academia, and I sort of liken it to siblings. You know, <laughs> they love each other really, and they they know they have to 
talk to each other, but quite often they don't want to speak to each other. Yep. And so you need someone, I guess, like an embedded researcher or someone like myself who actually goes and carries the messages between the two and actually tries to get them speaking again. But I, I don't know how we fix it. Some days you think it's just how it is. So do you consider yourself an, an academic or industry? I would put myself more industry, and, but I'm just working at a university at the moment. And the, the academics wouldn't have me. I don't have enough papers. The only KPI that matters to academics is papers. And so anyone in industry is going to struggle to actually really be accepted into that elite fold, you know. So do you think that in academia, research done within the industry is not looked at as the same value as that done in academia? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's almost like a, I wouldn't say an unwritten rule, and I'm not trying to say it's good or bad, but it, 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 unless it's getting papers in nature, it's not going to have the same respect among some researchers, which I'd probably put down as the more professorial, you know, hardcore kind of scientists. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, like, um, academics work really bloody hard. Yep. It's not so much a career as a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. They work incredibly long hours and have a lot of different pressures on them that are quite different to perhaps working when you can clock in and clock out um, at an operation. You never really switch off. So do you think there's a difference in the fact that there's a time uh, difference as well? Yeah, like in academia, you're obviously doing research to, uh, I don't know what the right way to say it would be, that you, you're doing research to build knowledge, whereas in industry, you're often doing research to get to a, a tangible outcome. You know, that's, I guess, the difference between science and applied science. Yeah. Don't you think that part of that, that conflict of why academia doesn't find that research valuable is because it's more outcome driven, whereas in academia, it's more knowledge driven? There, there's certainly that. Um professor was telling me the other day that my projects are very linear in that they have a problem and use methodologies to address that problem and then there is a result and I have no problem with that but he was using it in a fairly derogatory sense yeah. that we weren't really challenging the bounds of science but then you know that's the role I'm doing at the moment the projects that I'm working on have all been established talking with the operations and, and, the, and the team members there and we've come up with projects that we think are, are good and mm -hmm. that's that's the purpose. So do you think that industry understands that research is not fee-for-service? Everything seems to be boiling down to relationships here. Don't we have to build a win-win scenario? We can't just expect it to be like a consultancy, for example. I think that's been one of my minor frustrations as I went down to Adelaide thinking that seeing the win-win, that's front and centre saying, this has got to work. You know, This is obvious, isn't it? This is the way we should work it. Cam McRae would talk about boundary spanners all the time. I, I never, never quite liked the term because when I was a kid, if you called someone a spanner, that wasn't a good thing. <laughs> anyway, these boundary spanning people. You know, I remember I must have been in a meeting, must be five or six years ago talking about that, but there's not many. As far as I'm aware, I'm the only person from industry in Australia who's gone back to university in the last few years. I know Steve, you did, Anthony Harris, Bill Perkins back in the day at Mount Isa. But the fact we can count them on one hand is not a good thing, is it? But then why aren't there more embedded researchers? So I guess part of the problem there to me seems like, how do you show value in that space where you are a boundary spanner? How do you show value where you're part in industry and part in academia? Yeah, look, I think the, the first project I initially proposed to Mount Isa Mines had a clear set of goals, clear set of sort of KPIs for the research and was building into the exploration strategy of what we were doing at the time. It's interesting, actually, the focus when I first went down, I thought it would all be about the research and, you know, whether we hit goals in terms of understanding all bodies and applying that directly to exploration. What I'm realizing now is the focus is much less on the actual research outcomes and much more on potentially the educational and recruitment aspect. I guess me having boots on the ground at the university, just being able to interact with students and help them in their sort of assessment of career options. It's amazing how many students graduate and they have no idea what jobs are out there. I'd say most third years don't have a CV. They're still going through their university stage. Obviously, the good ones do and most of those people get jobs. Is the value of the training side on the industry or on the academia side? Oh, I would, on the industry, I don't think the academic side values the work I do. The research needs to be getting into nature and stuff and, you know, that it's just not of the, it's, it's not of the caliber that they are after. Which, again, comes back to what we talked about earlier, the stereotype of, you know, industry projects being seen as lesser. And I'm a, that's just how it is, I think. So if that's a value that the industry gets out, is that they're getting individuals that are better trained, 
what's the potential value that the universities could get out of it? Are they getting industry funding or are they getting their program subsidized or their research subsidized? It's going to depend on the project, but certainly I only work at the University of Adelaide if I can bring my, I'm sort of tolerated a bit like a gate crasher. You know, if I turn up with beers, they'll keep me around for a while, but the minute I start drinking theirs, forget it. So do you still have to make yourself basically sustainable? Oh, completely. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. My contract is annual. I think this year I've had three contracts so far. Wow. In terms of what I offer to the university, I feel that I really do add value. So as somebody who's, who's been through your transition as well, boundary spanner is a word. The other word is a knowledge broker. One of the things about knowledge brokers around the world is that they bridge supposedly the best of two worlds, but it can quite easily become the worst of both worlds. So they're neither in industry or academia. Yeah, that's a very good point. And for the first couple of years I was down in Adelaide, I, I felt very much like that. It was like having trying to have one foot in industry and one foot in academia. You'd think that I've had people say, oh, you've got the perfect job, you know, that's great. But then you say, well, actually, the academics kind of look down on me and, you know, there's not a great deal of respect around. I don't feel valued in that space. And in industry, certainly have been a few meetings I've been to with a company and sat down talking about research or about an honest project and scanning out things. And then at the end of that meeting, the industry geologist gets up and says, right, I better go and do some real work now. We do have this sort of, not a fixation, but in industry, you know what a hard day's work is. You know, you know, when you sat on an RC rig in 43 degrees for a day, you you come home, you know you've had a hard day. We can all identify hard work. But in the academic space, hard work might be challenging yourself that you didn't know something. You're all constantly challenging yourself. I kind of thought going down to Adelaide would be, in inverted commas, but like, easier than my role in Mount Isa but it's I was unprepared for how much harder it is and literally took a 50% pay cut when I went to do this job I'm not doing it for the money people seem to think that you're sort of on an industry salary while you're doing it but you're not and I think yeah I mean I think the way you've kind of described like academia and industry I think to me it seems like you know academia is is an entity that values skills of the past they really want to teach the the things that they've taught for a long long time and that's totally okay Industry on the other side is always looking at the skills to the future, you know, like what skills could we add into our organization that give us a competitive advantage. So there seems to be this, I think, gap which seems to be widening where academia is hanging on to the skills of the past or teaching those and industry wanting these skills of the future that have to get morphed into something. Well, and and I'm certainly not trying to be down on academia because all all of the academics I know work incredibly hard and they're very good skilled teachers and educators. But it's also partly the way our discipline is changing because 30 years ago, you didn't have a lot of the techniques around that we use now. Mm -hmm. So every year we're pushing the boundaries of what geology can do, what we can measure, how we measure it. And of course, the scientists involved in that kind of work want to pass that on. You know, every academic thinks that what they do is the most important thing. You know, yep. They have to, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. And it, it's challenging to squeeze all of that in to an undergraduate course. So what I'm trying to say is I think academia does value the, the new, but within the constraints of an undergraduate degree, there just isn't the time. So, and they've got to concentrate on, on the old stuff. But then you know, simple simple skills, but petrology, reflected light microscopy, you know, these things are dropping down the order of importance. But then, you know, you say to a lot of industry geos, you know, when was the last time you looked down a microscope? I guess that was the other point I was trying to make is that are we still a little bit of a prisoner of the past where we think these skills are still probably going to be relevant in, in 10 years? Well, this is something we deal with during Nexus as well is, you know, we are covering some of the more fundamental digging a soil sample, you know, recognizing minerals. So, I mean, isn't that going to be done by a drone by the time... Uh, in another 10 years? Well, I'd actually, I think there's been a bit of this about a lot of the, particularly the innovation in core scanning or mineralize the sort of or getting better value data, whether it be hyperspectral or geochemical. A lot of people saying, oh, so you want to put geologists out of a job, but I don't think so. I actually think it's going to allow geologists to spend more time being a geologist because, for example, if you can rock up to a, a drill hole and have a preliminary printout of XRF and potentially hyperspectral data. Yep. You don't need to spend three hours on the incredibly dull bit. You know, you can actually go to where maybe the iron kicks in or the potassium kicks in or where there's cow. You know, you can actually focus on the areas of interest more. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, right now, I think geologists waste a lot of their time doing things that are non-geological to get to an interpretive product that is geological. And we waste far too much time getting to that. To How that much level. geology is actually done by your average geologist? I call that uh, augmentation. So we're going to go through a phase where geologists are going to get better. 
So who, who wouldn't be excited by that? Because we're going to have data that's going to enable us to do more. I, I currently can identify about five minerals. If you augment me with some geochemistry and some hyperspectral, I can recognise 68. Why wouldn't I want to have those skills? So I, I don't think in the short term or the medium term that we're going to do anything other than become better geologists. Yeah, with the advent of more technology coming in, I think you know that, that that is really what the role of technology really should be, is that it adds value to what you currently do. One, one of the things we see with students coming through that I've had my eyes open to, I guess, is students are very quick to pick things up. Like you say, you know, you can learn a lot of stuff on YouTube. So really, I think with Nexus, one of the things we try and do is we, we don't try, we don't saturate them with content. We don't try and make them remember everything. In fact, one of the bits of feedback we quite often get is they just love being in an environment where there's information and there's opportunity to learn and they're not being told that they have to memorize it. Mm -hmm. You know, they can actually enjoy the learning rather than feel they've got to remember it. But certainly I find with Nexus just opening people's eyes to skills or procedures or techniques that they just haven't been exposed to before. And that's something that is very rewarding because, you know, everyone's smart. You know, everyone's going to find something that clicks with them that they want to pursue. And I think in the exploration space, just making sure that you've got a bunch of geologists entering the industry who are aware of MT and that regolith can be difficult and that, you know, we could use this technique for geochemistry or that one or that one. Just rather than just being told, you know, company X uses this particular procedure for soil, so do that. And then they say, well, why, why don't we sample the, the Gigi leaves? Well, why not? You know, can we trial it? Quite often we get early career industry people in Nexus saying, oh, well, you know, we do it this way because that's the way the company did it because that's the way the procedure was written in 1986. And encouraging the students to actually challenge and say, well, why do we do it this way? Why is our policy to always use that digest? Why aren't we trying other things? Why don't we do a trial of this? From people I've caught up with, you see that they are actually starting to change incrementally mm -hmm. through their inquisitiveness and their desire to test. And, and I think that's got to be positive. Personally, to me, I think the role of Nexus or you know, any of these kind of, you know, whatever we want to call it, micro accreditation courses, all of these courses that are going to come in is really, I think, to build the breadth of knowledge that we need to build in people coming into the industry. Like you're saying, you give them all these skill sets, at least it makes them somewhat informed to go in and ask questions in, in different ways. So I think that breadth of knowledge is something that we probably have lost, something that maybe companies with great graduate programs used to do. That, that's, I think, effectively what the role of those graduate programs was. And I think we've lost that level in industry. And I think that's where courses like yourself, I think, are filling that niche really, really well. I think we're uh, getting towards the end of our interview. Uh, before we let our guests leave, we always ask them two questions. So the first one is, what is an idea in our industry that needs to die? It could be an idea, a concept, could be anything that you think we need to get rid of. Personally, I think that we need to keep a much more open mind on a lot of the traditional ore deposit models. Syngenetic versus epigenetic debate has been going on since Agricola, but it's... It's something we pigeonhole ore bodies and, you know, we say it is a SCAN or it is an IOCG and I don't see where that adds, adds value. I think the, we need to be more flexible about, about what we even think of as an ore body or as, a, as an ore deposit style. That's probably one of my own personal things. John Aronsky has a nice way of describing that, that new sciences... Uh, embryonic sciences describe things and that we're just evolving now from a descriptive form of models to to more complex systems uh, and that just reflects the fact that our science is only a few hundred years old. All right so the last question uh, what is an idea that you think we should maintain in our industry? Again can be an idea, a concept, something that you think is fundamentally part of our DNA and we should keep. I think what I'm, in, what I'm enjoying seeing some of the more progressive companies do is empowering people and making the mining industry more about people these days. I see it with you know, companies like Oz, IGO, BHP, Rio. They really seem to be emphasizing that you know, it's all about the people and the person. And you know, I think that's, that's a good message because really it's, it's what we do with our lives and how we, how we live them. But you know, rather than it just becoming it, the minerals industry as a big corporate entity, you know, I, I, I like the fact that they're bringing, making it more personal, making it about people. I think that's a pretty good spot to end on. I think that's the ending. Thanks a lot for joining us, Richard. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's been great. Exploration Radio is brought to you by Steve and the Mod. 
This episode was produced and edited by Ahmad. We would like to thank the Walt Disney Museum for supplying audio and written materials used in this episode. If you want to find out more about this podcast, check us out on explorationradio.com or follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. And we're even on Instagram. And if you like this podcast and want to help out, well, there's two things you can do for us. Give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And consider supporting us in producing more of this content. You can find the details on how to do that on our website at explorationradio.com support. Until next time, let's keep exploring.